I'm Jason Residlo, reporting from outside the Gem Theater in Detroit for the 30th annual SAA Auto Outlook Conference. Stay tuned for remarks from Mr. Jim Taylor, the Chief Revenue Officer of Karma Automotive. So today's uh, purpose is to give you a kind of a fast trip through uh, evolution of Karma. I think it's a good, uh, call almost case study, again, in a very small case, as you'll see, but it is a, a model of what's going on in the industry and having to uh, choose the space that you go into. And uh, speaking def definitely from experience, having been on both sides of winning and losing, on several car models, uh, whether cars win or lose are exactly that. It's a series of choices, it's a series of trade-offs, and uh, those that the team picks well, cars sell, and the team does well. Uh, Converse is also true. So I'd like to uh, take you through our story and uh, what we intend to do here at Karma. So a quick history lesson, just to calibrate everybody. And uh, people in this, uh, I say this story almost all over the country, but in this city that where it's a, a feeding frenzy, of course, of news, and people are paid like you to keep up on every aspect of the industry, and whether it's to, just living in this town, everybody, I think, is pretty aware of, of Fisker and what happened during that time frame. As you go elsewhere in a country and talk to people about Fisker, they may not, uh, may or may not even have noticed that Fisker came and, and went in, in other, uh, more, I'd say, normal towns. But again, just a quick uh, history view here. The, uh, the brand itself was uh, on sale and launched uh, from a dealer standpoint in November of 2011. In a very, very short period of time, it was only a year, 2,300 cars sold in a lot of countries, 20 countries, a majority of them here, of course, um, but also 600 in Europe. A lot of awards, and uh, some of you sponsored those, um, primarily in the technology and the design area uh, that the car became quite famous for and uh, very, very, very successful. The uh, company that uh, purchased us, name is Wangsheng, that's not uh, kind of a household word, even in the uh, Detroit community, uh, not a high-profile supplier like the sponsors here today, Lear and, and uh, say Bosch and some of the other worldwide suppliers, but a well-established American supplier, does a lot of business in the chassis space, has been uh, feeding this industry for a long time. Say 28 companies, it's owned by a very uh, small, call it holding company in the U.S., and that's where our primary interface is, is with uh, the uh, the person there, Pin Nee, that actually runs this uh, division of Wangsheng uh, globally. This is a picture of our owner. His name is Chairman Liu. He's the actual passionate uh, owner behind the actual acquisition and the dream to be in the car business. And uh, so he's the primary uh, motivation for the, the objectives that I'm going to show you in a second as we go forward. And one point here to make on this slide is, is as I said in the, in the, in the uh, title, patient capital, uh, if you're going to be on the receiving side of, the, of this business, we talk about where's the capital coming from, it's definitely better than uh, private equity capital. Private equity is, of course, in America, very impatient, uh, has high demands, wants very short-term returns, and in a car business, that's a tough assignment. Having, in our case now, a patient uh, owner, patient capital, and a longer-term view is definitely necessary to be successful in the car business. His uh, directions to us, relatively simple, build me a, a credible luxury OEM. And, uh, of course, get the brand back in business as quickly as possible. So relaunch uh, what was the Karma, now it's been renamed to be the Rivero. And, of course, to be a sustainable business, you can't live on one car uh, uh, in any portfolio, in any company. So build out the portfolio and bring more cars to market and create some uh, business sustainability. So pretty simple direction, and uh, it's been up to us and the leadership team to fill in the blanks. So as this uh, story emerged, if you think of uh, almost three years ago, March of 2014, uh, arrived in Costa Mesa, there were 20 people left from the bankruptcy. So that's what the left side of this chart says. So one of the biggest uh, challenges we had and continue to have is to fill in a, a, a overall OEM capable team. And that's uh, uh, soliciting, and as you see by the logos here, uh, people to come to California from literally all over the world, uh, contingencies in Europe as well as uh, all of the United States here. So we've grown up to uh, be almost a thousand at the end of last year and uh, continue to go north of a uh, thousand early into next year. And uh, as it again tells stories when we come back to Detroit, one might think uh, based on certainly today's weather, it'd be an easy easy sell to get people to come to uh, Southern California, but it isn't. It's not that easy. This, this town uh, feeds on itself, loves itself, and uh, people love living here and love being in the industry and being in the, the pot that it is. You come to a call it normal city like uh, Newport Beach where we are, and, and uh, it's not as uh, auto-centric and uh, consumed with the business, and it, uh, funny enough, isn't as attractive. So we've actually had quite a challenge drawing people out. And of course, with the industry booming, people are doing well here, and there's lots of uh, employment if you're a good engineer. 
engineer. So it's been uh, quite challenging and also competitive for us to draw people out there, uh, given the other uh, startups that are in the business. But we have grown to the, uh, the fighting mass that we need to be launching our vehicles and to uh, being successful with the, the first uh, set of portfolio additions. So, second big decision and choice uh, we made is to bring manufacturing here back to America. So, actually this part of the story, I just thought Trump would actually like. Because the manufacturing was uh, done in Finland, it was a contract manufacturing, and our opinion was to be a credible OEM, to, to fulfill uh, our first objective, we really need to own our own manufacturing, do our own manufacturing, and on top of that, uh, do it literally in our backyard. So, we uh, went literally all over the United States um, and uh, checking all of the, the big states that want to write huge checks to incentivize you to come to those different states and at the end conclusion was literally non-economic. It was strategic to say that uh, our best shot at high quality quick turnaround with our engineering solutions which is the real part of the auto industry was to be very very close to our uh, engineering headquarters and where our, uh, the bulk of our people would be so we built a brand new plant in uh, Riverside, California. We moved over all the tools. The body shop tools came from Finland. Uh, but other than that, it's a brand new paint shop and a brand new general assembly that's purpose built for very low volume. And again, in this group uh, where our volume you know, turns out to be less than rounding error in the world that we live in, there are no real plants in this country that uh, specialize as they have for 100 years in Europe, building Lamborghinis, Maseratis, you know, Aston Martins at extremely low line rates and annual volume. So we had to uh, you know, be creative here and look around to find a manufacturing solution that actually fits uh, a completely different formula than what all of the US, other U.S. plants. So now let me uh, switch and kind of tell you what's our business, what's our business proposition, what's our story, our angle, and uh, how we, uh, we plan to be successful. So, uh, a little corny, but as everything starts with a customer, first is to know who are these people, what do they do, what do they think, uh, what, what are they like, and uh, a good start for us and a huge part of the asset purchase wasn't just the physical assets and the intellectual property, it was buying uh, those original customers. And uh, a lot of the original owners still driving uh, their Fiskers and loving them. Is that a solar roof? So there's an immediate impression like, whoa, that's different, that's cool, that's technological. And so there's a second impression. And third is, that plugs in or it's electric? So after those three questions, 20 seconds, it's over. They're, they're in or, or not, and depending on the customer uh, needs in this particular segment. But the, uh, the emotional attachment of the beauty in combination with those technology things. The second is just the facts of life up in the, the very narrow, uh, narrow band of, of customers that play up in this kind of price point is it's, it's unique. If I have one of the, these, will I be different than the other guys you know, on my street, at, at work, where I play, at my country club? And if it's going to be different, you know, I'm in. If it's going to be the same as everybody else, I'm not. So uh, that's a big, big uh, feature for us. And so ultimately, customization, unique uh, personalization is going to be a, an important play for us. And lastly, the fact that it is. It's a legitimate high-end luxury vehicle that's uh, not just born and bred, but will be manufactured and continued out of Southern California. And heretofore, this industry has been 100% European. The, the uh, six-figure North cars have been all sourced and brought in here from, uh, from abroad. Okay, continuing our, uh, our business model and our story, uh, we've been uh, doing some, I, I'm not going to go into this, this isn't a marketing audience, but some different approaches on the marketing uh, level, a lot of personal one-on-one uh, -on -one type meetings, a lot of personal engagements at the, at the dealerships and parties and things to make this uh, more of a one-on-one -on -one buy than, than a mass market buy. But uh, coming right off this presentation, too bad he left, I'm, I'm glad he said what he just said, so we had the decision and with all of the focus in the industry about Tesla's go-to-market approach, you know, should we have dealers? No dealers. Should we go direct? Not. So the decision we came down to is uh, a blend, but primarily we're using conventional uh, tried and true distribution, a dealership model. I liken this a lot more though to Bloomingdale's where you're going through boutiques and you're going through uh, you know, Gucci and then you're going to a boss and you're passing through the different boutiques. That's the approach we have. So this is just a, a small visual that the dealers that we've selected around the country, very few to start out with, um, will have us being, as we say, a box in a box or a boutique kind of approach where they'll allocate some portion of their already ultra-luxury uh, franchise to us to allow us to make 
uh, make the, uh, the customers that are coming already through their shops. Uh, they already have an established uh, ownership base. This allows us to piggyback on that and have a, a small separate showroom. In our case, uh, interesting in comment from him, but we will have our own factory store right by our headquarters in uh, Orange County. And uh, that allows us to put together, again, an ownership thing that happens. I know Corvette does it, but in Europe it's a lot more common where you want to go to the factory, you want to pick up your vehicle, you want to visit some sort of a museum, you want to see the headquarters, you want to see the plant. And that kind of an experience we're going to be able to set up uh, in or Orange County by having our own dealership there as well. Okay, and now uh, again, talk about uh, preaching the choir or, or a group of analysts like this. I can skip through these pretty fast because this is what you guys do for a living. But uh, big surprise, our uh, segment's very small. On the right side, it's probably more important that questions asked, who do you compete with? Do you compete with Tesla? Of course, they own the EV market, so we, we must. And uh, a lot of the owners that originally bought Fiskars and, and now have Tesla S's were on the fence of which one to get. Of course, as Fisker went away, that wasn't a choice, but a lot of uh, those owners were also in play and are now currently valuing whether to uh, switch and come out of their Tesla, especially as the volumes got so high, so it's no longer you know, unique and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, satisfying that issue for them to be different. Um, going around the circle, you think of course, four doors, four passengers, reasonable space, not a two plus two, but still very stylish, sexy, European. Porsche Panamera is very successful, and now the new ones, you know, with the new styling, even better. Um, the BMW i8, of course, if you're looking for big brands and reliable brands, and uh, electric and a um, unique, low volume, Maserati Quattroport, and the Aston Martin Vantage and Rapide. So that's kind of the cluster of, uh, of uh, competitors that we'll be drawing from or competing with as we go to market. If you go into the outer ring, then you get into um, the very high end, again, north of six figure variants that the uh, big German manufacturers have as well. But this segment drops off pretty substantially if you go north of $110,000, $120,000. Big surprise, this group. If I take, uh, I'm glad I did stay away from exact numbers for this kind of an audience, but uh, luxury being about 10% of uh, the market. If it's 17 million, it's about a million seven. And start coming all the way down that uh, the market uh, is defined sometimes by brand, sometimes by price. 70 to 150, 1 to 150, where we're, we're going to play and uh, come down to that outer ring and finally get down to that little uh, small group. There's only really 40,000 vehicles uh, sold a year in that category. 2.4% of Lux, if you take that greater than 17 million, it's uh, what we call a sliver of a sliver of the people that we're going after. So out of necessity has to be extremely surgical marketing to find those places. So uh, more news flashes, EVs are growing, but uh, from an extremely small base. So good news is uh, with the success of the, the Volt, uh, cars like the Bolt coming to market, uh, the success of the Leaf, the Tesla. I think the space has uh, been validated enough that people aren't viewing that as a, as a big challenge or a super high risk or being a, a real early adopter, but still very relatively small space. Again, no new news here that uh, China not only is a huge market, but also with the aggressive policies that they can take and, uh, and demand, as you said, with uh, earlier Beijing can just make a statement and things happen a little easier there. Uh, but the electrification uh, of their car market is probably going to happen at a, a more rapid rate than here. But still, really small numbers if you see luxury EVs in 2015, 30,000, 15,000, 6,000, still extremely small market. And so we look forward and we hired a few companies that are here today to go out to their crystal balls and take a look and see what we, we could see going forward into China. And again, no surprise that there's going to be a good growth in EVs, uh, both on the uh, um, extended range EVs like we have and then also full EVs or BEVs uh, going forward. And we expect to play heavily both in the fact that uh, it's the largest luxury market on earth as well as it'll be the largest uh, electric vehicle market. And whether it's being driven by their own needs uh, to meet their overall emissions and fuel economy goals, as you all know, all of the large OEMs are coming here. So that's good and bad. It's going to validate the space. It's going to make uh, more alternatives. It's going to allow people to have better choices in this whole EV spread. On the other hand, there'll be a lot of competitors in this space as well for us. Okay, lastly, couldn't go without talking about the connected car. Glad I put this slide in. Um, but in our particular case, this uh, whole tsunami and this whole conversation that everybody's having, and, and uh, as we just said, that's a great quote. We're going to use that one from, from now, the more connected cars and white papers. But the uh, 
OEMs, you know, got a tough choice right now. Everybody has to pick of all these things. I think the very uh, first presentation was this, is uh, which of these uh, solution sets am I going to choose? It probably won't be a lack of technology or alternatives to satisfy this. It's which ones do I pick? Which ones do I play out? In our particular case, we have to be very cognizant that we are a startup. We're a restart. We had a nice running start because we have hardware, we have customers, we have a plant, unlike some of the other newcomers um, coming with brand new uh, cars. But on the other hand, we are a startup, and there's only so much that you can put your arms around and manage and control, or, or you sort of die trying. So we have a very much a walk before we run uh, approach here. We are not heading uh, towards this whole, whatever that last expression was, I can't repeat it, sitting in a back seat with your iPad doing everything you can while the car takes over strategy. Um, we are mindful that our customers buy these vehicles, put them in their garage, look at them because they like looking at them, but also actually like to drive and like to participate in the driving. That's a conscious choice for them. So the approach for us in this connectivity is uh, like one of the early economic slides, which it'll be the connection of the data itself. So understanding the customer, understanding his usage, but also from a, a pure hardware standpoint, taking the diagnostics off for health checks and then doing the over updates to uh, do the service and the repair and, uh, and making the customer's experience better because of the inconvenience of having to go to dealerships and and the time it takes to do those repairs, um, and the simplicity, and Tesla really has, has done a great job of leading the road on this particular front. So that's the focus we'll have for connectivity, uh, connectivity in the uh, very beginning, and then as the, frankly, big suppliers and the big OEMs uh, with much bigger uh, wallets uh, sort through these technologies, vet them out, uh, prove which ones are, are being attractive to customers, and we'll take a much more of a, a fast follow approach. So in summary, we say uh, what, we, uh, what we are, we're about art. These really are, sounds uh, cliche, but these are art collectors, uh, and that's what they're purchasing is beauty and art and uh, celebrating their enjoyment of that. Craftsmanship, uh, old school craftsmanship, uh, but mixed with technology. Um, it doesn't escape them that this is an eco play. I think unlike uh, the first launch of Fisker that was very heavy on the, the green play, this is sort of, oh yeah, by the way, I feel good about this because it's, it's a, for me, uh, an, an eco play. On the ride and the performance of the vehicle, again, we're not going in this rocket ship uh, competition that's been uh, going on first with Tesla and now with some of the other new arrivers to see if you can get to a two-second car or something. That's not our play. These are enjoyments. These are uh, cruisers or GT rides, and, and it's out uh, five and a half seconds. 5.2 isn't, uh, isn't a bad uh, a performance. We're not apologizing for it, but it's also not a space that we're going to be the, the super performance uh, folks. Connected, definitely. On the other hand, autonomous, I'd say not a chance. Doesn't fit with our positioning or the super, super tech, uh, not a chance. So the best words I can come up with is just old school. Some people still like to go out and drive a car. On the other hand, be very up to date and have a high technology product uh, underneath them. So that's it.